Since the last board meeting, I've had the opportunity to visit two school sites, Pioneer here, the sites I want to go to every day or so. I've had the pleasure of seeing the campuses, watching teachers interact with their students, and talking to our great educators and staff. But as a sixth grade math and science teacher at Bristol, I wanted to share an awesome event that we have put together. We work to talk tirelessly for our students to bring them something that they may not have gotten this year. We want to do building community while learning science in an engaging way. Since our Bristol Bears can attend science camp this fall, we're bringing Camp Bristol Bears. All of our sixth grade team members have collaboratively designed science lessons and utilized content areas in many different ways to give our students a camp experience. We've incorporated some camp activities as well as a few new ones. There may even be a few banana slip picks coming out to be had. Not real banana slips, but the kids love it anyway. We're also making sure that we follow all of our safety guidelines to keep our students safe. I cannot wait, though, to hear how our language arts teachers feel about teaching science. <laughs> they may even want to switch after. <laughs> Thank you so much to our parent community for supporting our students. Many of about probably 95% have contributed a little bit extra to help students in need. And that's just, just a wonderful feeling to see our families do that. At the end of this week, students will walk away with stronger teacher relationships greater love of science, and every bear is getting a shirt, so Friday ought to be super awesome. We just wanted to invite you to come and visit next week because we think it's going to be a really great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Can't tell. There we go. All right. My name is Melissa Rosner, and I'm in my glasses. And I teach first year at Orange Creek Elementary School. I would like to start off by thanking the board and the district administration for the decisions that have been made that led us to our return to in-person learning this school year. I would also like to thank the site administrators, office staff, and district nurses who have all been working tirelessly to keep up with the ever-changing COVID guidelines and procedures. I know this has been a challenging job, and the teachers appreciate the work that is going on behind the scenes to keep our students in the classrooms with us. I especially want to thank all of my fellow teachers and the support staff at all district sites. The past 40 days have been challenging in so many ways, but also rewarding in so many more ways. I know that every USC staff member has worked hard to get the school year off to a great start, and we all deserve a huge thank you every day for all that we do. Thank you. I know we don't hear that often enough, so I'm going to say it again. Thank you. I began this school year with almost as much anxiety as excitement. I was worried that I had forgotten how to teach a class full of six-year-olds. After 20 years of teaching, I felt as nervous as I had on my very first day in the classroom. However, after meeting and greeting with my 24 students in the first day of school, that anxiety was quickly replaced by a growth mindset attitude of, I got this. It was so amazing to be back in the classroom and to not have Zoom issues or sound glitches. It was wonderful to see bodies and seats and see how excited the students were to be in the classroom with me. I could keep in mind 24 kids asking me over and over if it was time for lunch or when it was time to go home. I was just excited to be there with them. As we began to settle into our daily routines, I could see where the challenges lay and where we were easily breezing through our day. I was making connections with my students and their families. And more importantly, the students were making connections with each other. I knew we were truly becoming a classroom community when upon introducing a plan you do not think called knocked out where students face off and one of them gets knocked out if they don't answer their math problem right. The students proved to me that they could play just to have fun. Everyone cheered for everyone. No one was a poor sport about having to sit down if they got knocked out. This game is just one example I see of our classroom coming together as a community. Every day I continue to see academic and social emotional growth from my students. And every day, no matter how tired I am or how much other stuff is going on behind the scenes, I enter my classroom and continue to have that I have this mindset. I probably worked harder this past 40 days than I had during the first 40 days of any other school year, including last year in distance learning, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. 
We've all proven that we are resilient and we can turn a challenging situation into a fantastic school year. Can't wait to see what the remaining 140 days of school break. And I'm so excited about the wonderful students and families that I get to spend that time with. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren. Um, so I just wanted to speak as a person who is so mad and I don't have my concern as much for the love of here. But I really just want to leave with the fact that we have more in common than not. I know that our opinions on how this should be executed might differ extremely. Um, but we're all parents who love our kids and what works best for them. And I think that what we need to change is the willingness to listen to each other. I think it's easier. And yeah, we have the right to yell at each other as hatefully as we want. But we also have the responsibility to report ourselves respectfully to one another and work towards change together. Our little private echo chambers where we only talk to people who agree with us are not helping our kids. They're not helping us make progress. They're not making Brentwood better. And according to the science downtown, everything is supposed to be better. <laughs> um, I just want to speak to some of the logic um, um, what I see as objectionable to some of these arguments. And please disagree with me. Like, let's discuss it if you don't agree. Um, first, it's psychologically damaging that kids wear masks. I disagree wholeheartedly. I'm a parent of two very different children. One is in third grade, the other is in first. Now, can we talk about kindergarten distance learning for a second? My son can't read, he's working on it. He's neurodivergent. And he had no computer skills. So obviously this is not built as a perfect experience for learning. He had a wonderful, like amazing for their principal. And, um, and a team behind him, the school counselor was amazing. He tried to build in supports for him. But my son woke up every morning and the screen showed that he was the worst dad. Um, my daughter did better, but eventually her career ran out. She's not a saint. Um, and she too struggled. One day crying herself back to sleep and not going to school at all because what was the point, she said, of having friends and never talking to them? And I said, I teared up too. Like, what is the point of part? Um, the other thing is, what's the plan? If we eliminate masks, we make them optional. Are we going to make the classrooms twice as big? Because then social distancing will be a necessity and we don't have the space. So I just don't understand what the next logical step is. Um, I can see the clock ticking down. So let me go here. Choice. Okay, so this has been a big theme, right? Everybody's choice is important. But what about the parents of the people who want masks to stay? What about the people who believe in the power of vaccines? Like, do you see a lot of pieces of polio in front of it? If not, that's because they're vaccinated. I understand the research is limited, and I understand that's scary to put something in your child's body. However, I'm not okay with this almost statistic. Almost no kids are suffering fatalities. Well, which kids would we okay with? Minus the zero. Let's come back together, let's work together, and let's hear each other out. Thank you. Does anybody else have any uh, desire to talk? That was probably the wrong way to put it. Is there any yellow slips? <laughs> Okay, I'll take a motion to close the vote. I move to be closed. Second, please. I'll second. Uh, motion and second. All those in favor, close the public comment. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. <laughs> item eight, which is consent items. Anybody want to move forward? Any notes? If there's nothing cool, I, Mr. President, I'd like to make a comment about number eight. That's okay. Uh, the point uh, one. The floor is about to go forward. Uh, one of the things you'll see on our personnel report uh, down on the other section uh, is an approval for reclassification of Marianne Hayes for a coordinator of alternative education to principal. Um, one of the things um, that we started last year was an alternative education program with a homeschooling and an independent study component. 
Um, and under the state's leadership, that has grown to a program that's over 210 students. I think it's been very clear from the beginning through her talents and dedication that um, she is a principal. That's the job that she's performing. Um, I, I also want to point out that um, she had many staff members that weren't able to be here today that sent me a specific message and just wanted to say that that program has been built because of her skill and talent and they can't imagine having anybody else there. So I just wanted to point that out. It's up for your consideration tonight. Thank you. If uh, no one wants anything cold, uh, I'll take a motion to approve 8.0 to 8.7. We're going to be a first and second item to 8.7. Second? I second. Motion has been made and it's been seconded. All those in favor of approving 8.0 all the way to 8.7. Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed 8.0 to 8.7 Congratulations, Mrs. Taylor. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Uh, here is the fields uh, 9.0. We actually have a request for a public speaker in regards to this. Uh, I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of opening up the public hearing again? No, this is the judgment of All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's 9 point zero. Public hearing is now opening up, Caroline. This is my number one. Thank you. So, um, a couple months ago, uh, there were some people that gave a presentation about the textbooks in the district. And this is before I knew that this was on Zoom, so we couldn't make public comments. And we couldn't make public comments for the presentation because we hadn't seen the presentation. And we did not know what the conclusion was going to be. And I was actually a little taken aback by the fact that they thought that the textbooks that we have in school uh, right now, which are a wee bit old, um, were balanced and were uh, good representation. And, you know, I, I sat through, I volunteered in the classroom a lot, so I sat through the walk across California, walk across America, and I was very interested to, under, to know that everything in Redwood sits on the land. So I was really interested to see, like, how did you get this Yokoop land, and where did the Yokoop go? And there was no, nothing, not a Lot of information on the who other than the VR now standing on the land. Um, during the Revolutionary War, there's a whole chunk of information about the Revolutionary War missing, including our favorite person that everybody learned about, Colonel Lafayette, right from Hamilton. He's not mentioned in the book, and we would not have won the Revolutionary War against the British if France had not given us a humongous influx of money. For which we have never thanked them, and guns and people to help to help us out. We would have lost our revolutionary war for sure. So when we're looking at textbooks for the next expenditure, can we reevaluate? I know they all come from Texas, but there has to be a better textbooks out there for our children that provide perhaps more robust information on events that happen. I assure you the kids are young enough to absorb the information, and they like knowing more. I've done presentations in the classroom, for example, for February, which is another point of contention with me. Um, everybody can name two people from the Civil Rights Movement. Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King. Did you know there's people still alive from the Civil Rights Movement? Harry Belafonte. Dale, Dale, that guy. He, was, he took all the money that he made from his music, and give it to the civil rights movement. He went on many talk shows where he was supposed to talk about Dale, and he spent the entire talk show talking about civil rights movements. So we still have people alive today, and those people never get brought up. So, you know, we, we, need, we need more robust materials to work with. We need to allow our teachers to, you know, teach more robust materials. We can do it, and show them to it. So, expenditures for textbooks, just please keep that. Thank you. I'll take a motion to 
Move that we close public hearing. I second. We had a motion and a second. All those in favor, close the hearing. All those in favor, close the hearing. Aye. 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 Update. Yes, uh, good evening to the board. Um, I just wanted to do uh, a little bit of, uh, of an update on where we are with COVID-19. Uh, um, so in, in terms of where we are federally right now, um, uh, the FDA PA just recently um, gave some advice uh, recommending booster shots for specifically for those that have Pfizer. For those over 65 and those at high risk. Um, so that's still going through the process a little bit, but uh, that's where we are there. A lot of people have been interested in uh, what's happening with uh, vaccines for 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, so Pfizer just recently announced that they're going to submit their vaccine data for 5 to 11 year olds uh, to the FDA for emergency youth authorization. Um, and uh, they're, they're planning on doing that by the end of this month. And if they're approved, it's possible that those vaccines would be available as early as the end of October. So, um, you know, you never can predict what that process will be through the FDA, um, but that's what it's looking like right now. Um, as I understand it, the Pfizer dose is a lower dosage than what the adults uh, get, um, but it would still be a two shot regimen uh, going forward with a similar distance and timing is what they're recommending. So that's up to the FDA. Um, you are, there's been a lot of questions that we received about vaccine mandates. There are some larger school districts um, across the state, LA Unified. Um, there's uh, West Contra Unified is talking about it. Uh, Oakland Unified is talking about it. Um, my answer to people has been typically that vaccine mandates come from the state. That's not a local decision that school districts typically make. Um, but there are districts that are considering it right now, so I just wanted to let you know that you're hearing about that. Um, something um, that's been a big part of uh, the work that we've been doing over the last uh, month is uh, following up on the governor's announcement of a vaccine and test mandate for all school employees. Uh, so that's everybody that works within our district. Um, the, the difference is, is now that we're required to verify vaccination status of all workers, in the absence of that verification, um, we're required to ensure that they have uh, submitted a negative test once a week. Um, so we're working through that. Um, we've been collecting the information. We're very close to having it from almost all of our employees. Um, and it's, we're required to be in full compliance by October 15th. Um, so basically, when we come back to break from break, we will be following that directive as we go forward. So we'll have verification um, and or testing as we go forward for that. Um, and then I also want to state that our, our we've been very fortunate to have testing at Debbie Hill um, every day available to families and staff. Um, we're looking on at actually uh, expanding that um, through some county health money and state health money. To be able to provide um, more uh, more availability for testing at multiple sites, so that one school model might actually go away. We might have it available at multiple schools throughout the week. So we'll talk more about that as we get closer. Um, the California Public, Department of Public Health. You've seen. I just wanted to put this slide up there because I've been saying that the guidance for music, drama, and sports we've been still waiting on. It was promised uh, in the year. We did finally get it. There wasn't a ton to it that was different, um, but we are looking at our sports programs, our music programs, our drama programs to make sure that we're running them safely and within the requirements of what's been provided for the California Department of Public Health. Really, some of the sports that are more notable um, that would require testing are something like wrestling, where the health department is determined that we're going to ask to be hazardous actually for the athlete. And so that requires um, that requires regular testing by those athletes. So we'll also be using their testing information to work with that. So a lot more information for that. Um, actually, I have some uh, relatively, I want to preface it with relatively good news uh, on the COVID front compared to our presentation in the last one. So 
It's a little hard to see. It's a little better on the back end, but still what you can't see is the, the lighting indicator. So just a reminder, I pulled this off the website today from Contra Costa County Health. Um, so you can see sort of a, um, a peak up, up here where we were meeting last time, and it did take a pretty steep fall in Contra Costa County. We're seeing more of a leveling out as we, as we go forward. So while it's still relatively high, um, it's lower than it was going forward. We caught this. This chart that you've seen um, uh, looks at it a little differently. It looks at positive amongst the vaccinated, um, and then the unvaccinated, which is this top chart, and the, the vaccinated is down here on this blue line. It shows the number of positives um, that way. So comparing. This is by age group in the last um, uh, 30 days. It's, it's really like you just saw a walk group. So this top line is four or under, and it's uh, ages five to 12, 13 to 18, 19 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 51 to 60, 61 to 70, and so forth. And so um, one of the things that we've been hearing from the health department is, and, and this is an important distinction, is they are seeing quite a bit more cases um, for children that are 5 to 12. Um, that's been an outcome. But what they are also telling us is they think that's likely a, a, um, an outcome um, of the Delta variant, but also increased testing as a result of the testing that's being done as a requirement of quarantine and so forth. They're seeing more cases. Their percentage is still not as high as other uh, as other age groups, but because uh, schools been back in session, there's been more students getting tested. But student school age students are very much getting um, COVID testing positive for COVID. This is also extremely difficult to see, but it's actually uh, also positive news. So on that chart, um, this shows this shows the number of um, positive cases within a community. So Redwoods there where the arrow is, and it says 190 in the last 14 days. So 190 new positive cases. When we met last time, that number was 427. So definitely we're we're seeing a decrease as we come down. See that whole chart just disappeared over there on that side. So I will um, I'll make sure that this goes up on the website so people can see it. It's really nice. I just can't. It's, 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 a, it's a very nice chart. I know. So it's it's rather light. This one, okay, this one it's a little prettier. This is you can see the general trend. This is hospitalization. So you can see a trend down in hospitalization. And the blue is ICU, and the green is uh, over for COVID, but uh, blue is ICU, uh, green is just uh, typical COVID hospitalization. And then I want to remind everybody that the, the board has asked us to be as transparent as possible. So if you go on our very front page, you can see this VOC COVID resources, and that's available there. We have a dashboard that we publish every single week, and the people that that is there as well. Um, there, you can also access our testing that's available, and everybody has a QR code that you can use there and get it. And then this is just what our dashboards looked like last week. So this is published on Monday. And again, we show the symptomatic cases from the week, so the number of staff and students that had any symptoms of COVID-19, regardless of whether they were uh, positive or not. And then the exposure to positive cases, so these are students and or staff uh, that were um, uh, within six feet of somebody who was positive for more than 15 minutes, and then the positive cases. So we have seen that start to trend down a little bit, but um, it's been a very short period of time, so I think it'd be dangerous to call it a trend right now. Um, and then, again, this is small, but you can see that um, this is also on our website, so if you want to just go on your phone and see that uh, right now. But this shows uh, all the cases for the month by school. So that is my, my update, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Or any questions? That being said, we're going to move on. 10.2 approval of unaudited actuals. Um, Oh, <laughs> 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 
good to remember. Um, one thing I have more just a couple of slides to cover tonight. Um, and as, as we walk through the unaudited actions, this is before we were recommended for approval. Um, first is to sort of walk through, um, really quickly, as a reminder, where we've been. I know the teachers were very eloquent about that tonight, um, but but really just 1920, which was just, just over a year ago, about 18, actually 19 months ago, we entered a pandemic, and that was, you know, we, we had turmoil, really, for three months and 10 weeks. We got correction, et cetera, and we, we basically got our kids at home just this morning. We ended the year and started the year for 2021 um, in July of 20, just a year ago. And again, we were still in distance learning because of the health, health issues in the state and the guidance that we provided. We went through that process. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a step back and remember that when we were in distance learning, we were in the pandemic, all of a sudden the state finances went, went where no one really wanted to go, but we were, we were panicked about a lot of things. And the budget we adopted for 2021 wasn't very happy, wasn't very positive for us as a school district, basically a flat funded, if anything, were negative. This, and as we went through the school year, the finances around us improved, but schools didn't get any more ongoing money. The state and federal government gave us money in, in very specialized pots for one time purposes. It was very restrictive of what we were trying to do. And, and the bottom line is trying to educate kids in the classrooms. And we moved into March of just uh, just in 21, which just seems like forever ago, but it was really only about six months ago. And we went back into hybrid learning. That means about half of our kids came back on campus, as you all remember really well. And half of them say this is learning, we went through that process. And that was for 12 weeks, and we ended the school year, and then more one time money came to us from the state. And the state gave us a budget that had some pretty positive things in it for the most part, but the, amount, the huge amount of money that came to us that the state generated as revenue didn't come to us in ongoing money, it came to us in costs that were really hard for us to spend, um, really in, in realistic ways. And now we've started this year, we're three months, we're three months into the school year, 10 weeks, we returned to in person, which everyone was really excited about. It's nice to see we get back to school. The reason I go through this is I just wanted to remind everyone that really in the last 18, 19 months, we've gone through a whole bunch of changes and changes in the way we receive funding, but we always look at it ex post facto that, oh, we're here now, everything happened. Although we're responsible for what really happened in chunks of time, and we had changing, changing regulations, changes in the funding that we have, and we still, to the state, still don't have all the fine tuned details of the current state budget. We may not know that until January. And then educators, we're going to have a fine line about implementing all those things on our principals and our teachers who are already running a hundred miles an hour, and we're going to get more of it. So it's just a reality that I, have to, I think I have to remind myself about. And reminded, you know, we're we're in a changing environment, and, and things have changed. And in the, in the twenty, in the thirty something years I've been in education, but really the fifteen or twenty that I've been in finance, it's, it's the first year that's been anything like this. It's really crazy. Um, and I think it's just a, a preface to some of the things we talk about. So as we look at twenty twenty one, and we're we're talking about last year and the closing of last year. Our original budget was built on really bad projections and assumptions because in May, a year ago, in 1920, the state budget was, was, wasn't looking that great, and we basically opened 2019 or the 2021 school year with very new, little new money, but we were held harmless to the 1920. <laughs> um, when the state actually adopted the budget, they said, yeah, it's a little better, but really they did all the tricks. The money that they gave us was one time and federal money to back to our budget. And, but they didn't tell us all the strengths, and they said, you know, be happy with the legislative component. We, as educators, use the board, we're left holding that bag. Um, I need to get on some bucks. Um, state fiscal health did improve. Um, the budget did not improve for 2021, but, but the health did improve, and we did receive essentially a lot of one time COVID relief money. And the 2021 budget adopted with July 2021 trade bill language that affected 2021 really in reverse, and I'll talk about that when we go through this. Some of the money that we got in May, the state switched it to the trailer the language, and we'll talk about that. So 2021 recollections, 26 weeks of distance learning, 12 weeks of hybrid, really an unprecedented year with the impact on all of the staff, students, 
tariffs. And really, lots of state and federal legislative one time money. I'm going to say lots because that's a big word. And across the state, lots of money went out one time money. So I'm looking at our enrollment trends, and, and I know this is a packet as well, and it's hard to see up here, but the, the really dark, thick black line is this year. That's the enrollment for this year up to really just yesterday. And you can see that, okay, that looks pretty good, but let's compare it to the rest. If you look at the purple line at the bottom, that was last year. That's the year that we just climbed out. The yellow and the green line are two or three years ago. In 1920 is the line at the top of the page. Now, the red line at the bottom and the green line at the top is what we call CBOs. That's when we do our census poll. So the census poll is coming out in just a couple of weeks for us. And so when we look at the comparison where we were last year to where we were two years ago, we're better than we were last year, and that's a good thing because we still continue to see enrollment. But we have to watch that over here, and it will affect our multi-year, both the first interim, and as we do our budget development in the spring. I mean, remember, when we adopted the budget in June, we were looking at really flat enrollment in next year. So we can see enrollment is improving, so I'm excited to do the work that we need to do to bring you the first interim report with updated enrollment. So we need to watch that, and we'll watch it sort of when we take a snapshot of our ADA in, in at the end of February, beginning of March, as we look at P2, and then at the end of the year, as we look at really finalizing our budget for 22-23. Unaudited actuals is really a look at the close of books for 2021, and it's, it's presented to you for consideration tonight. And it's really, when we look at that, we're comparing really to what happened to estimated actuals, but when we adopted the budget in June, we adopted a budget and we actually had an estimate of where our ending balances would be. And now the audit of the actuals closed that. And everything that happened in June and July, closing up the books and paying invoices and, and addressing some of the needs we have are, are reflected in that. So looking at total, total revenue went down about $4.8 million, which I'm going to talk about. The expenditures also went down by about $3.8 million. Um, revenue to expenditures um, went down, so you can see in estimated actuals, we have Positive balance of about 6.5 million, went down by about 1 million dollars. And our ending balance went down by about $634,000 based on the total budget. So, as we look at the unrestricted side, which is really the, it's, it's, it's the one that we have the most say over, is looking at, we have four sources of funds looking at LCFF. Our LCFF revenue was down just a little bit because of ADA adjustments we had to do on how we calculate our accounting head staff or federal. Revenue on the unrestricted side is, is really our law funding that change. We've got, a, as always, we get a little bit of uh, additional lottery as the state closes their books on lottery. Other local income, which is taxes and revenue and, and, and some other things that go on local revenue that went up just a little bit. So our total revenue on the unrestricted side up about $384,000. Looking at the expenditures, certificate the we, we, had a, we didn't realize as many expenditures we projected in June. That's really a lot to do with the site budgets. And remember, we, we closed the books really essentially in May, so there are still things we expected in June. We left those budgets open. And again, because you know, even though we were hybrid, it was still really hard to have our teachers come and do some of the work, so those budgets roll over. Classified up just a little bit. Benefits um, down. Um, one, because we estimate our stores on behalf and that we don't actually do the calculations until July. So our benefit costs were down just a little bit because the stirs on behalf was estimated a little high. Supplies down just a little bit, really because um, we didn't realize the expenditures that affected and we moved some expenses to one-time money as part of the process. And in services, you can see our services costs were moving down about $640,000 under expected for a couple of reasons. One, we moved money to some of our one-time money where we were able to do that. And secondly, we looked at, um, we moved, and that, that includes looking at um, utility costs, moving those to one half cost um, for at, at this time. And then we saw some savings in utility costs as we close the books. And then you can see our total expenditures down about $1 million, and also our contribution to restricted was also decreased by about 680 for the same reason we were able to do some of those expenses as well. Now you remember when we, when we had, when we adopted the budget in June, and shortly thereafter, we, we reached the settlement agreements with our, our labor groups. Part of that included using about $6 million in one-time money over a couple of years. And we're already starting to do that process to get out of that, use those one-time money to re realize money 
and our IMS record will help us over the next three years to meet those agreements and the three year we have to do with the state or the county. IMS record in the balance, basically, you, you know that um, expenditures went down and revenue went up just a little bit, so we are in balance on the IMS record side increased by about $2.1 million. Um, on the restricted side, this is where it gets interesting. And you know, for me to stand here and say, yeah, this makes sense, it's a crazy year. And that's that's not the that's not the explanation that makes sense. But if you look at this, LCFF revenue on the restricted side went down about forty four thousand. That's really changed the property tax. On the federal side, our, our revenue went down by about one point eight million dollars. For federal money on the restricted side, for federal federal and state on the restricted side. They allow you to budget the money. If you don't spend it, you can't carry it over. So what you do is you reduce the revenue, you reduce the expenditures, and you, it's called, um, you actually show the revenue in the next year. So it's not a carryover. So it looks like it's a decrease, but really that revenue shows up in the next year. But the way we have to do books and the accounting rules show that it looks as a, like a decrease in revenue. But really those revenues and those funds are, are present in the next year. And, it, um, and the same thing in the other state, uh, this is where it comes back to is we receive both in-person grant money and extended learning grant money in May, um, quite a bit of money. And when the state adopted the budget, they moved about $4 million of that money from the state money to federal money. And they did that in July. So we had to go back and change the books in, in, the, in, the, 2021, in, the, 19, in the 2021 school year. That money got moved to 21 22 but it shows us a decrease in revenue. That funds is still in the books, it still shows on the federal side in the 20 in our next school year, but it's a reduction in the 2021 school year. Other local revenue went up a little bit, really because of some local funding issues, taxes, and some donation money really on, on some of that side. So and really on the restricted side, on the unadded actuals for 2021, the total restricted revenue is a, shows a decrease of about 5.2, but really because of the way that we have to do the accounting. And our contribution also shows there that the contribution, we didn't receive the contribution on the restricted product side from the unrestricted, and that shows up on the unrestricted side. On the expenditure side, very similar. Um, certificate went down just a little bit. Classified costs went up. That's really because of the hour work that happened in May and June when we got those time cards in, as well as extended learning in the summer school program that pays for the aides and that, that work in those programs. Our benefits went down just a little bit, really because of the estimation of stirs on the cap. The supply costs went down, really because when you take federal money, you have to budget the money as expenditures. If you don't expend them, then you, you show them that shows us a decrease in expenditures if you move those money to the next year. And the same thing on services. Because those money, when we get all that federal money, we have to look at it in an account. At the end of the year, we take the account away and move the balance to the next year. We can't show it as an any balance. Um, or a carryover or an unrestricted dollar. We had some capital improvements relative to some of our, our uh, personal protective equipment, and we had another outgo on reductions relative to tuition costs of the county that we didn't realize. So you can see expenditures down on the restricted side about $2.4 million. The restricted ending balance, therefore, was also down about 2.7 million really because the revenue went down um, more than the expenditures or and the balance decreased a little bit, but again, uh, those revenues will show up in the 21 and 22 school year. Components of ending balance um, for 2021, total ending balance about $16.5 million, or 3% reserve, um, and restricted reserve comes out of that, so there's about 8.2 million. You can see the components of what makes up our current ending balance, and about 2.1 un unsubstantiated ending balance. Again, that helps us make our three year expenditure plan relative to the agreements we made in June with our labor costs. We have seven other um, funds outside of Fund 01. We have the Cafeteria Fund, Capital Projects, OPEB, which is our other post employment benefits. Our major E funding is Fund 21. We have our developers fee comes into Fund 25. We have a small amount in school facilities, and that's our partnership that's really paying for the planning for our own free site. We have some capital projects that we got from the projects, so that's just a, a snapshot of those funds. Next steps is the, the unaudited action submitted to the county following tonight, depending on your action. Um, 
the next time I'll be in front of you, we'll be doing some budget updates between now and December, but we'll have first in our budget update in December. And what we have to watch is really we have to watch these expenditures. As you know, what you've seen on the, on the pink slips in front of you is we continue to add staff. We've added staff both for regular ed, we've added staff on special ed, and we've added staff for alternative ed. And those things, those, those expenditures will show up. And we have to watch those as we complete our first general. Enrollment also is improving. As you can see, we've grown about 90 kids since our third day of school. So we need to watch that. That's a positive thing. Um, I'm excited to build that into um, our first interim. And then our one-time funds, we need to continue to watch what the rules are, but just exchanging those rules and how we report those and how we use them appropriately. Um, I've talked about that. We, we, we've got some settlement costs that are still working through the process to get, get those paid off. That will be updated in special education, one-time funds, and you've seen that for the last statement. It's just we just have to watch the legislature comes back in January we'll to see what the priorities are. Yeah, and, and if there are no questions, the yeah, unaudited are presented for your approval tonight. Thank you, Robert. Does anybody have any questions? This is an action item. Um, 10.2 approval of unaudited actuals. And uh, I'll take the um, motion and a second to approve this. Essentially, the state requires to watch, since Dan passed this resolution, that the legislature we have to pay attention to how much our revenue goes up and how our expenditures go up, and they pay attention to those things. In our study, the math we have to do as part of the amount of the actuals and part of the closing the books is we've met the GAN on it, and we don't have to give money back to the state. So that's an approval. That's, that's what that basically the resolution says is we've met the GAN on it, and we're within the GAN. Uh, just, uh, for two years. Yes, it's, 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 it's a two year look. Every year is a two year look. Thank you. Uh, again, this is an action item. I'll take a motion and a second to approve the uh, approval of the agenda. And to approve 10.3 uh, approval of the agenda. Have a second? One second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, approving the agenda. Good evening, Board. Um, this relates to the public hearing in 9.0 and simply states that um, of our adopted, of the materials we've adopted, that um, in content areas and at all grade levels, we have enough for all students to have access to um, what we've adopted. So we have, we have met that sufficiency of materials. Thank you, Michael. Again, before this is an action item, I'll take a motion and a second for the approval of resolution 2021-12. I move 10.4 approval of resolution 2021-12. Second. 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 10.5 approval of resolution 2021-13, which is the board is asked to consider approval of resolution 2021-13, a resolution to authorize the design build method of the Long Tree School Park. So good evening, board. The, this resolution allows us to go out on our queue, which means we get to call by bidders to then bid. So that's what this does. It allows us to go qualify better for the design build process to build the school, which is the same process we're using to build both the, the theater at Bristol and the project in Athens. What will happen between now and then 
And we'll come back to the board with some detailed plans for the school, the scope of what we plan to do. Now, can before we before we actually go to bid, and we have those companies in bid on the project. So this is just allows us to go to an RQ and all the qualification process for qualifying bidders. Robin, if you wouldn't mind, just um, could you very briefly explain what the long term school is the project? Yeah, so thank you. It's it's we I'm I'm being very forward is that I'm not naming the school, it's just the school site next to Home Tree. So we have about 15 acres over there and we're planning a K-8 school. So we're in the design phases right now, we'll be bringing it back to you. And that's what that is. So it's, it's our plan is to build a school on, at the Lone Tree site. So Lone Tree and Smith Lane. And to work through that process to build that school. So this will allow us to qualify bidders. Then we will you'll see the plans and the details of what we go to bid with. And then that will block a bit of that time following your input on those of that planning process. Thank you very much. Again, for this is an action item, uh, we would like to have a motion and a second on approval of resolution 2021 2 Move in favor of item 10.5, resolution 2021 13. Second. I second. Awesome. On the motion and a second, all those in favor of approving resolution 2021 13. Signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by zero to approve. This is the resolution that approval of resolution 2021-14, which is the board is asked to consider approval of resolution 2021-14, a resolution to authorize the piggyback payment with to in the buyer all next for four of us. If you mean when if you Purchaser, especially after the contract for construction, is even already $1,000 yet to a bid. In this process, the resolution allows us to use a process where another district has gone to bid with the buyer class, and so they have, the, they have a quote already based on that bidding process that's legal for us to use. So this resolution allows us to use that bidding process called piggyback. We piggyback on their bid. So they've already done that process, they've done a bid, they've collected that, they bring it all. And based on the processes, they, they have in buyer as the, as the lowest cost to, to, to purchase a portal. Is there any step of school that would get this portal? Thank you, th thank you, Mr. Dudek. That's a great question. This is actually to add office space at the district office. Thank you. Again, more this is an action item 10.6 approval of resolution 2021-14. I'll take a motion in a second, please. I move that we approve the item 10.6 to approve the resolution 2021. So since the board is asked to consider approval of resolution 2021-15, the resolution, the resolution adapting the terminations in one quarter mile, 500 foot finding for the Bristol Middle School theater site acquisition. Yeah, thanks. So this is, uh, I'm not going to say it's a regular process, but it's part of the process that you follow when you, when you add, when you basically, you're building on a new site. Are you building on a site? Part of the process is to walk through this uh, environmental study. One of those components is to complete the air quality study, and the city and state requires that. So we've met all the other requirements for the environmental, except for this one. We've been waiting for the air quality one to get back to us. They provide us with a map that we can do or look at, which is on their website. Which we did. We can't find any air issues within the 500 foot. And we'll have to within 500 feet of Bristol Middle School. So the resolution is running tonight. We find something different, we'll come back to you. But this is a requirement of the state part of it. This is working through the process to get Bristol Middle School through. The definition of Bristol Middle School is here. Thank you. Again, board, it's an action item approval resolution 2021 15. I'll take a motion that's second. Move in favor of 10.7, resolution 2021 15. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving resolution 2021 15. Aye. Opposed? 10.7 by 0 approved. 
approval of the speech and language waiver to the board is asked to approve the speech and language waiver for Jennifer Jenkins. So, for our you can see me in as a waiver for one of our um, speech and language pathologists. She served as an SLP aide for us and also worked under a waiver last year. So, this is like the annual while she completes her um, cert certification and master's program in speech and language pathology. Thank you. Board of Action Item and the Board of um, Approval. Uh, the Board is asked to approve speech and language waivers. Uh, all those in favor of approving the speech and language waivers for Jennifer Chambers, it's by the same time. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I move that we approve item 10.8 to approve all speech and language waivers. Second. Thank you. This is so good to do. All those in favor of approval of speech and language waivers for Jennifer Chambers is the final say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Zero. Congratulations. Uh, 10.9. Approval of board member attendance at conference. The board is asked to consider approval of the request of Tweed uh, to attend the Washington, D.C. Federal Advocacy Trip, which will be held in Washington, D.C. on April 20th. 5th to the 27th, 2021. Expenses will include reimbursement requests for food registry, registration, flight, and telecom accommodations before me. Voted as brought my attention to that there may be another uh, board member um, that might be interested in that. Before Stephanie, you express your interest, but please you basically uh, explain a little bit what it is. Yes, it's a uh... Conference uh, conducted by the California School Board Association, and it's the inaugural uh, advocacy trip. So, this will be the very first advocacy trip for uh, school boards, superintendents all across California to visit with professional leaders and um, other important stakeholders in Washington, D.C., to advocate for more funding. As we know, public education needs in California. So, so forth, um, part of your process, um, anytime uh, a conference is requested by a member of the board is to bring it uh, forward uh, to the um, to the whole group to consider it. So you can consider a motion just for me, or you can consider a motion open for any member that wanted to attend. I think the, the timeliness of it, even though it's in April, is I believe registration is just open or just about to open. So, that would be part of the consideration. Anybody else besides Stephanie Freed would like to look at? Um, then the only um, outside of that and Stephanie's this request would be um, if we could also include the daily rate of the board policy for meals. If we can make a notation now. Okay, this is an action item, so. This is the approval for board members, Laura, me, and Stephanie, who attended the conference in Washington, D.C. And the addition would be your expensive reimbursement to include registration, flight, hotel, and the other one. So I'll take a motion. All those in favor that you two can make one of them. As, as board minute, as board president, the staff said we will approve that board member attendance conference to include board members that have expressed the uh, the one. Thank you. 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 Thank Okay. All those in favor of this allowing the attendance of the conference in the audience say aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations to the two of the Washington DC. Board member comment, future agenda items. Anybody else to put any other agenda items? Thanks, Mark. We'll say thanks to you. I have um, an item I just want to comment and recognize um, Santa Heritage 
You will each pick up about 100 chairs as you go out. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to um, get the information on which school, if there will be uh, vaccines for students ages 5 through 11, which schools will be the site for vaccination. Yeah, one of the things I'll continue to bring the COVID update next time, and if we have, we're not quite sure how they're going to do the rollout of vaccine distribution, and so that's gone through many different iterations. The last thing that we were hearing was that we would potentially be able to have it um, at one or more of our sites, um, sort of like we did with them earlier for the for the older students to walk and see it all the time. Sure. I'd also like to thank our uh, SRO Matthew Thank you for attending. Thank you for the discussion.